So here we are at the final stretch of talking with Loyal Rue, Michael Dowd, Connie Barlow, and Loyal Rue, talking about Loyal's 2011 book, Nature is Enough, Religious Naturalism and the Meaning of Life. And he has a chapter in here called Religion Naturalized, Nature Sanctified, that has a subsection in here called The Promise of Religious Naturalism. So we're going to be talking here amongst ourselves about uh, the future of religious naturalism, both with what Loyal's talking about here and Michael's and my experience with bringing natu religious naturalism to a variety of audiences over the past 12 years that we've lived on the road doing this. Uh, so I actually picked out a couple quotes there that Michael and I often use as opening words for uh, liberal church services when we're doing guest sermons. So yeah, both, my, both liberal both liberal Christian churches and Unitarian Universalism. Yeah, churches. me just Unitarian Universalism. So Michael will read the first part and then we'll pass it to Loyal to read the second part. Okay. So this is from Everybody's Story. The epic of evolution is the sprawling interdisciplinary narrative of evolutionary events that brought our universe from its ultimate origin to its present state of astonishing diversity and organization. In the course of these epic events, matter was distilled out of radiant energy, segregated into galaxies, collapsed into stars, fused into atoms, swirled into planets, spliced into molecules, captured into cells, mutated into species, compromised into ecosystems, provoked into thought, and cajoled into cultures. All of this, and much more, is what matter has done as systems upon systems of organization have emerged over 14 billion years of creative natural history. This epic of evolution is the biggest of all pictures, the narrative context for all our thinking about who we are, where we've come from, and how we should live. It is the ultimate account of how things are and is therefore the essential foundation for discourse about which things matter. Amen. No? Yeah. Praise Darwin. <laughs> Praise Darwin. Right, right. So, in this section here of Nature is Enough, you have a quote that says, I fully expect the day to arrive when religious naturalism will prevail as the most universal and influential religious orientation on the planet. The source of my confidence in this prediction is the epic of cosmogenesis itself. Given a chance, this story is too compelling, too beautiful, too edifying, and too liberating to fail in captivating the imagination of a vast majority of humankind. And then you go on to sketch out what you call two possible scenarios for how religious naturalism, by whatever name, but what we mean is a sacred view of the universe and based entirely on the evidential understandings brought to us by the collective intelligence and collective learning of science. You sketch out two scenarios by which this might happen. And so if you could do that, and then Michael and I will chime in about, based on our experience on the road, uh, what we think of both of those two. Yeah, I, I think what we're talking about here is the emergence of a new mythos, a, a new story, one that's based in nature and evidence uh, that has the power to unify people around the planet, uh, to coalesce uh, uh, an organization of consciousness. How is that going to happen, if it's going to happen? I think it will happen, and there are two possible ways. One is gradually, and the other is abruptly. I mean, a gradually uh, is for people to change their thinking and to embrace this new mythos uh, person by person by person, perhaps community by community, and it sort of uh, spreads uh, like uh, lava, <laughs> slow uh, and inevitable. It's so compelling that when people 
think about it for a while. If they understand it, they think about it for a while, eventually it, they get it. Um, the other way, uh, which I think is probably more likely, is for, is for the global environmental problems to get so bad that we have a phenomenon of overshoot and collapse on a global basis and a huge dieback of humanity and a sort of a holocaust which would then be uh, followed by uh, a resurgence of the human popula population, but first and foremost in their mind would be, how did that happen? Uh, that happens because we uh, excluded ourselves from the natural order. We treated ourselves as somewhat supernatural and uh, not as natural beings. And so as the as that happens, people will be drawn to a narrative that sees us as embedded within the natural order, and that will be a kind of religious naturalism. I think that's more likely, but who knows uh, what's going to happen. But eventually, uh, I, I think that uh, the story is, as I say here, too compelling, uh, too, uh, too believable, too plausible uh, to just uh, die away. So that gives us the personal wholeness sign that once we're in, well, right now we've got the cognitive dissonance between people hearing some mythological story and then getting the science. So the personal wholeness would certainly be there, whether it's gradual or abrupt. The social coherence is what we're saying will definitely be there if this is the way that you get ecological integrity. Mm -hmm. If you have, as you, as, as you say, you naturalize religion, and you sacralize the science. That is, they get that nature is enough, and not only that, nature needs to be revered because look right. what happens when we don't. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, and I come at it from a slightly different, I, I, I agree 100% with that way of thinking about it. I think that we're seeing both of those, well, we're seeing one of them now, which is that there are people for whom traditional religion is no longer meaningful. They've stepped out of their church or their synagogue or their mosque or wherever, but they're basically finding a secular, science-based, ecological, evolutionary orientation to be more soul-nourishing, more intellectually satisfying, and that's happening outside religion. There are also thousands, tens of thousands of people within every religious tradition that are finding their way into this, what Braun Taylor calls dark green religion, dark green spirituality, that is a deeply ecological and evolutionary understanding of soul nourishment or inspiration or spirituality or whatever you want to call any of that stuff, growth. And so that's, all, that's already happening now, but it is very slow. And a lot of people are simply dying off, and the younger people are coming into that with sort of more of an ecological evolutionary consciousness. So I think that that's already happening now, but I, I actually agree with you that I think that there's quite a strong likelihood that in the coming decades there will be overshoot and population uh, declining health and, you know, 100 years from now, uh, we're having this conversation in 2014, I think it's quite possible, in fact, perhaps even likely, that there won't be any more than a billion or two billion human beings on the planet in 100 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a significant die-off given there's seven mm -hmm. billion now. And I agree also that all of us as individuals and as groups um, naturally want to find, make sense of what the hell was that all about? How did that happen? And let's not let that happen again. Mm -hmm. The way I sort of am coming at it mythically is I believe that the mechanistic worldview, thinking of God as a supernatural being outside of a clockwork universe, will be seen as a minor eddy in history, uh, a, a sort of a, a dark age theologically perhaps. That is, we... We basically, what Thomas Berry called spiritual autism, that we've been blind and deaf to uh, what God, reality personified, has been speaking and doing for hundreds of years now because of this mechanistic mindset. And that we are now sort of the prodigal species. We've, we've squandered our inheritance. We've, you know, we're waking up to our predicament and we will wake up in a big way if there's this die-off and the challenges in the decades to come. And hopefully it will also be, it'll, it'll be what I'm calling now publicly the Great Reckoning. That is where humanity has been out of right relationship to reality and we're now about to experience the consequences. Mm -hmm. Not because some supernatural beings pissed off at us and punishing it, but because we've been out of right relationship to reality and we're about to experience the consequences. I'm hoping that it's also, and I'm declaring the possibility, that it also will be the Great Homecoming. Humanity, like the prodigal son, coming back home to reality. 
I find the current theist-atheist debate to be a form of collective insanity because both form, both theism, God does exist, atheism, God doesn't exist, both of them have a unnatural, what I call fictional notion of God in mind, a supernatural being outside nature and time, while the one true God, that is reality personified, nature, time, mystery personified, is we've been out of right relationship to, reality, to that reality, and we're now about to experience consequences of biblical proportion. So I think there will be that sort of both the gradual that we're seeing now, but probably also some kind of a sudden. And I think Bron Taylor is right. I highly read, if you haven't read his book, Dark Green Religion, he catalogs all the different ways around the world that in different movements and different streams, people coming into this deeply ecological evolutionary understanding of reality and valuing evidence as our best understanding of the nature of reality. You know, there could be one way to think about this is to look at a possible synergy between the two possibilities. Mm. Uh, there's a gradual movement uh, mm -hmm. towards uh, mm -hmm. a religious naturalist perspective, and the further that movement progresses, the better prepared we'll be after yeah. the collapse yeah. uh, to pick up the pieces, because there will be resources there yeah. uh, for us to articulate uh, the new story again in the wake of the Holocaust. Isn't this depressing talk? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, one, one, let me say one other yeah. thing, uh, which is I, I, I was thinking about what we were sp speaking about earlier, and I mentioned that I have sort of a line in the sand that I have at least for the last four or five years. If somebody's on my line of the sand, I don't care what their metaphysics or theology is, uh, but um, if they're on the other side of the sand, I'm going to do what I can to convert them, you know, bring them into this side. The way I have been speaking about that is deep time eyes, that is an evolutionary understanding of reality goes back and forward millions and millions of years. A global heart and a global commitment um, that is a commitment not just to their own soul or their religious group or their nation state but to the whole planet and a valuing of evidence as in some very real sense revelation or divine mm -hmm. communication whatever. I now, I've now sort of, I'm putting that one aside, that's still probably true, but I've found now there's a two-step sort of, if, the, if people abide by these two sort of, if these two are fundamental values for people I, I, won't, I don't care anything about metaphysics and theology. And the two are, are they committed to living in right relationship to reality? Whether they use secular or religious names for reality, but are they committed to living in right relationship to reality? I call that integrity, the practices and the, the mindset and heart set of living in right relationship to reality. But if somebody is committed to living in right relationship to reality, whether they're a secular person or a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever, that, that seems to me to be important. Reality is evidentially known and collectively discerned. Well, that, that's the big question because yeah. some people will say, I live, in, I live in harmony with reality and God the Father is no, I understand. reality that, and so God's will as expressed in the Bible is... No, I understand. That's why I usually yeah. qualify it and say yeah. what I mean by reality yeah. is like Philip K. Dick saying, you know, reality is that which when you stop believing it, it doesn't go away. Yeah. Right. The, the, so that's what people come into living right relation to reality as evidentially known and collectively discerned. Mm -hmm. The second is... Are they committed to ensuring a just and healthy future for humanity and the larger body of life? So is their sense of purpose, mission, value, whatever, but if they, if they have that, if they're committed to living in right relationship with reality and, and committed to doing whatever they can to help ensure a healthy future, it's like to me metaphysics and theology and philosophy and all are so secondary compared to those two. They're my in-group. If, if, if they got those two things, I call them in-group. Yeah, well, I, I, would, I, I would just reverse that. There's no big argument here, but I'd reverse it and say that the metaphysics is primary because you don't get past the mention of the word reality without doing metaphysics. I mean, right, but you've got that. Jack Hott, for example, who doesn't consider himself a naturalist, is actually critical of religious naturalism, and yet he's a profoundly ecological, he, he, right. those two things, right. he's strong there. Yeah. So I want to leave space, not that everybody has to give up all forms of supernaturalism, they can have a deeply ecological right. commitment, yeah. even with some form of yeah. woo or naturalism yeah. or whatever. Yeah, well, that's, that's been just because his metaphysics doesn't bother you very much. He's sort of a panentheist, and so uh, God is in nature, and uh, uh, or nature is in God, rather. And, uh, and so living in harmony with nature is, ipso facto, living in harmony you with You got it in! <laughs> <laughs> he said earlier on, he wanted to make sure he got ipso facto in there. Oh, ipso facto, the scholar. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think the distinction I see happening here is, as I sort of, based on this book, Nature is Enough, Religious Naturalism, 
um, I was talking about the future of religious naturalism, which we're discussing, but what I see here is I really have to make a, a, a distinction because I guess Michael and I don't care as much about religious naturalism as we care about an evolutionary, ecological sense of ultimate concern, ultimate value, ultimate commitment. And so for me, it's really probably this book, Everybody's Story, Wising Up to the Epic of Evolution. Well, it's now called Big History. Or Big History. That's really what we're more concerned with. And for me, there's two, two things that go with it. Um, one, if people get everybody's story in the way that I demand it be gotten, and I, that's why I like to work with kids first, mm -hmm. is that the story ceases to be what we see in science textbooks, even big history to some extent. And that is, we're learning about something out there. Oh yes, that's the universe, that's planet Earth, that's evolution. And then we get nothing here. And for me, teaching everybody's story especially to children, it's identity, identity, identity. Mm -hmm. This is my story. Mm -hmm. These are my ancestors, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? These are my cousins, these are my relatives. Getting that sense of identity, so that, that's basic in there. The other one, when I'm talking with grown-ups, and I'll call them grown-ups, because, you know, kids are primary in this regard, and the others are grown-ups. Uh, is that it has to be practical. Whenever I, let's say, do a guest sermon somewhere, there's always something practical I'm giving them that can't come from anywhere else except an evolutionary understanding of basically human nature. Mm -hmm. And so Michael and I, for a long time, many years, well, maybe four, seven, years. seven years or so, uh, one of the things we'd always do, and we'd blow people away and they'd want to learn more, is we're doing kind of what you do with original sin. And that is, religious liberals, oh, we got to get rid of that stuff. Humans have the potential to be good. We're all, we all have this inherent self-worth and dignity and everything. And we're going, yeah. Everybody well... Everybody gets a trophy. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and we're going, nah, you know, there's something useful here that was adaptive, that religions had with original sin. And now the adaptive value is getting rid of the sense that that our wrongness in behavior means that we're inherently abnormally bad. And you do a great job in this nat naturalism book on that. We give primarily the example of supernormal stimuli and mismatched insects. And so Michael, just give Loyal a little sense of just how we give people a sense of freedom when they themselves are struggling with an addiction or a loved one is whose life is being taken over by an addiction. Yeah, the last six or seven years, it's really been sort of front and center for us, uh, where prior to that, it was more sort of universe story, and we are made of stardust, and sort of the identity piece that Connie's speaking about, and, you know, with the universe becoming conscious of it, so all that kind of stuff. And then about seven years ago, we really shifted to where, we still sometimes do that, but mostly evolutionary psychology, evolutionary brain science, human nature understood from an evolutionary in deep time understanding and the fact that our deepest instincts are just as compelling as any animal's instincts, you know, as you know, and yet they're mismatched for today's conditions. So we have instincts for sugar, salts, and fats because 99% of human history, humans weren't, you know, we it wasn't easy to find sugar, salts, and fats. So having a craving for those things allowed our ancestors to survive long enough to reproduce. One of the things we know about testosterone in all men and all women, it's a human universal, is that the higher the testosterone, the more people take risks and the more they think about sex. And so, and, and when somebody gets elected into public office or become ordained or in some way there's a rise in status where people are admiring you where they weren't before, testosterone levels go through the roof. Mm -hmm. And so this makes sense of both sort of our temptations and being surrounded by what Connie mentioned, supernormal allurements or supernormal stimuli, that is things we'd normally be allured to, such as things with concentrations of sugar, salts, and fats, things that appeal to our sexual titillation and, you know, gossip or scandal or fear. Politicians play on that a lot. We have instincts to pay attention to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we get distracted, we get addicted, we waste time. Um, and now the concentrations of these things, I mean, internet porn, internet gaming addiction. I mean, the Chinese, we talked about this earlier today. The, the Chinese government believes that the greatest threat to their nation is the fact that they've got an entire generation of young men 
boys, teenagers, and young men that are profoundly addicted to internet uh, gaming and, and many to internet porn as well. So what, what I found is that giving people this evolutionary understanding of our instincts, it's like, oh, well, of course, of course, of course I'm this way. Of course, of course, of course my children or my grandchildren are, have struggled with this, that, or the other thing. Which then lessens the shame and blame and allows us to, A, talk about stuff, you know, such as infidelity or addiction or whatever, without that sort of heaviness like, oh, God, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Mm -hmm. But also the sort of wisdom of ancient mythic stories that helped us see that, you know, that there's, there's something we're born. We, you know, we're born with these instincts. Uh, we don't choose them. Um, but the fact that we have them is just something we've inherited. And the way I mythically interpret the, the Christian mythology is that there is... Pretty much, I mean, pretty much all religious and spiritual traditions and certainly the recovery programs would agree that the only way to find freedom from these addictions and the sort of sinful nature is through integrity. And I, so for me, as I talked about earlier, for me, Christ is the personification of integrity, not a supernatural person, but so integrity is that path. But this sense of our nature, our nature being mismatched for today's conditions, um, understanding why we are the way we are, why we're driven by certain things and tempted by things and whatever, allows us to discuss this stuff. And we found, I mean, I had, for example, with my first TEDx talk that I did in Grand Rapids two years ago, in 2012, I did, a, it was called Why We Struggle and Suffer. And it was all on evolution, psychology, and brain science. And I had, because Grand Rapids, of course, is a very conservative part of the world, I had three evangelicals independently come up to me within about a two and a half hour period after my program. And all three of them said basically the same thing, which was, I was a young, young earth creationist until I heard your program. Now I've got to accept evolution. I've just got to do it in a God-honoring way. I mean, one guy said, he was probably in his mid-twenties, he said, I always thought that evolution was about Darwin DNA and dinosaurs. I didn't know it was about how to live a more Christ-like life and have healthier relationships. Mm -hmm. So that's that practical side that Connie was mentioning, that mm -hmm. the, the sort of the practical side of evolutionary thinking mm -hmm. um, has been really uh, beneficial to a lot of people's lives. And Connie has a whole program called Modern Women with Stone Age Instincts. And it's, it just really gives insight into why, you know, I mean, storing fat. That's stored energy so we could survive the harsh winters and the droughts and the lean times. I mean, it's like when you understand all this stuff from an evolutionary perspective, it, you, we, we can lighten up about ourselves, but also, paradoxically, it makes it easier to be, to, to, to be on the path of integrity because we're not feel ashamed of blame. But it also, Connie has remarked many times how much compassion she has for others understanding, you know, this stuff. This, this goes back to what we talked about earlier. Uh, expand or broaden the range of your knowing and deepen the level of your understanding mm. and uh, expand the scope of your affection. Yeah. Those things feed each other yeah. and the more you know about the universe and the living systems, natural systems mm -hmm. and social, the more you know about these systems and how they work uh, and the better you understand their interconnections between them. Uh, that liberates you. That's what's liberating about the great story. Uh, that liberates you to loosen up and expand the scope of your affection. That right. is to include other people in the circle of compassion. Right. What it also has done, though, is it's helped when I've spoken in sort of moderate and even somewhat conservative settings, which I don't do a lot, but I occasionally get a chance. Some courageous evangelical minister invites me in more. One of the painful elements for many Christians, especially on those on the conservative side, is that a fact is that the, great, the highest rates of divorce, spouse abuse, alcohol addiction, and porn addiction are in the most religiously conservative, mm -hmm. Bible-believing parts mm -hmm. of America. Mm -hmm. And the point that I try to make in those settings is that that's because you've got an inadequate understanding of God's Word. You're thinking of God's Word as merely locked in, frozen in time in some mm -hmm. book, rather than through all forms of evidence. Mm -hmm. And that what I sometimes say is that any young man, for example, I mean this is also sometimes an issue for young women, but it's rampant among young men. Any young man who thinks that the reason he's occasionally tempted, or maybe a lot tempted by internet pornography, is because his great 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 grandmother ate an apple. Mm -hmm. Is going to be clueless about how to live in integrity. Right, right. He doesn't. You, we're not going to get the guidance we need mm -hmm. from those ancient stories. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm lifting up evidence as modern day mm -hmm. scripture. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. You mentioned the, the kind of the, the epic of evolution in, in its in its the whole story. The more we know, 
What I found of late, as Michael mentioned, moving away from some of the more remote aspects of we are made of stardust, even ancestors' tale, uh, Richard Dawkins of who our exact ancestors are going back through time, I'm now experimenting with something new that's closer in, and yet it's something that evolution can give people that traditional religious scripture, scriptures cannot, but it's closer in. And I just experimented with a new version of it this past Sunday in a guest sermon in a Unitarian church here in Iowa. And I called it Stories Big and Small. And what I find very effective for me, anything effective for me, I then try it on other people. You know, mm -hmm. obviously it's like, wow, this is, this is giving me juice. And it, a lot of this goes back to our colleague in the Epic of Evolution, John Cleland Host who's been interested in his ancestors for a very long time. He's got some Native American ancestry in, in there. And so the first thing I, I, I did is having people recognize that if you have a deep understanding of time, and if you're able to have some family understanding where the stories of struggle and suffering have been passed through, then wherever you are in, in some element of, of struggle or grief or whatever, you put it in context and you remember, oh my gosh, my grandmother or my great-grandmother had to blah, blah, blah. Certainly I can handle this. Mm -hmm. if, if she hadn't persevered and handled that, I wouldn't be here, you mm -hmm. know? Okay, so get a grip on this. Feel the emotions, but get a grip. So, for example, I told a story that when my mom was dying, I sat her down... Uh, with her younger sister, um, with a tape recorder at that time, and I tried to record whatever they could remember of their parents' stories who had both immigrated from Hungary. Mm -hmm. And I heard some things that I'd never been told, partly because my aunt thought my mom had told me these things and she hadn't. And one was that my grandmother lost her first two children here, you know, in Detroit, immigrating there to some kind of disease or something before the age of five, my grandfather, I didn't know, my grandmother was his second wife. His first wife died of goiter. His first and only child there died before. He lost his first three before my mom was born. And so I was grateful for it at the time. And now I realize we have got to pass forward these stories of suffering and perseverance. We can get so solipsistic. You know, oh my God, the stock market will go, you know, went down. How will I ever retire and be able to play any golf, you know? <laughs> Let's get real about this stuff here. And so that's on the one thing, but then this Sunday, and so I was encouraging people to, to not only think of those stories, but make sure they pass them forward. Not just the good stories, not just, oh yes, your great-grandparents immigrated from Norway or wherever, but no, is there a story of suffering and perseverance or a big mistake? Pass that forward. Can I share the Mickey story? Sure. I I'm doing this interview series called The, uh, the Future is Calling Us to Greatness, where I'm interviewing through Skype about 40 different people that are mostly major leaders in climate change, peak oil, and sustainability. And the questions that I'm asking have to do with how do you how do you stay inspired to be in action in the face of really scary stuff, and what their work is. Well, I was interviewing Nikki Silvestri. She is the uh, executive director of Green for All, which is the organization that Van Jones uh, uh, founded. And her, the whole interview blew me out of the water. But she's an African American woman, and when I asked her, so Nikki, how do you what 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 do you think of that wakes you up each morning to be inspired to be in action? And she said, I'll tell you the truth. Every day, without fail, I think of my ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? She said, yeah. Like, for example, my great-great-grandmother, who was repeatedly raped mm -hmm. and had her children taken from her mm -hmm. on the plantation. And yet she didn't kill herself. She persevered, and I wouldn't be here without it. And then she had a couple of other stories, like that. her great-great-great-grandfather, who uh, has leg or his feet cut off? You know, I mean, it's just like on the slave ship. Yeah, the slave ship. And, and I, I, I just like. I mean, I found myself my eyes welling up with tears mm -hmm. because I mean, I think, I mean, I'm sure we all, not we all, many of us have those kinds of stories of hardship 
uh, in our past that we just don't know, we've never mm -hmm. been told. Mm -hmm. But to have her, you know, she has these and she carries them and she says, I meditate on these every day and it wakes me up inspired to do whatever I can because what I'm dealing with ain't nearly as bad as what they had. Every been. day that I step into this cabin, I think about the people who built it and lived here without electricity, without yeah. running water. Uh, try having a baby uh, out in the middle of the woods uh, in a log cabin with no help um, and, uh, you know, cutting the wood and uh, just really basic uh, survival. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in such a bubble of prosperity and convenience that we, we really don't have easy access to the experience of most of humanity. Yes, exactly. We don't have easy access to the experience of almost all of humanity. It's, it's amazing. So we're, we're, uh, we're deluded uh, by history, and uh, the great reckoning is, <laughs> is on its way. Then, uh, then it's really going to be important for people to have the, the capacity for sacrifice, because we will have to make sacrifices um, constantly. Right, right. And so where the evolutionary epic comes in, or at least... Uh, a willingness to agree that the earth is more than 6,000 years old, it's yeah. got a deep history, is uh, th th this is a new thing that's happened for Michael and me, is we've had our, our uh, genetic code decoded very cheaply, you can get, get this done, and you know with his Y chromosome, for the man the Y chromosome goes way back, mm -hmm. undiluted, mm -hmm. and for women and men we have mitochondria that mm -hmm. go way back diluted and undiluted and when you uh, the the data that they've put together for this they can give you a place where that Y came from mm -hmm. they can give you a time where it came from and same with the mitochondria mm -hmm. so we'll constantly be he'll be bringing up King Niall and I you can talk about this in a moment but where I go to is an extension of the stories pass forward of my Hungarian mm -hmm. ancestors and just my grandparents suffering in Detroit. I can go back more than 50,000 years on my, my, my mitochondria and conjure a story in my mind of a northeastern Siberian grandmother. And again, this is a maternal line mm -hmm. all the way back because mine goes back. It's Asian, not uncommon for Hungarians. Mm -hmm. And I go back regularly and I think about, there was a story where the woman who carried that mitochondria, the reason it came through, and I'm here, and my mom was here, and my grandmother, is because the men came back one day from a seal hunt, and for the second time, mm -hmm. there was no seal. And here was my, and I put her at whatever my age is, she's, I'm 62 now, here was my mitochondrial maternal ancestor, there in the house, still very useful, she could still sew and do all that. But her daughter, and there was a, a toddler girl who, they were going to starve. That toddler was going to starve unless she went out and walked out that night and had a peaceful death with hypothermia. And had she not sacrificed for the family in that way, I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not a real story. But it's an imaginative story that this epic of evolution gives me that I can take as real. And oh my gosh, I think of that a lot. Yeah. Mm, that's powerful. That's powerful. Well, when you read the, the piece before about something in Lyle's book where, um, I forget the exact words, but what it reminded me of, is that I've been saying now for quite some time that the, the mechanistic worldview, thinking of God as a clockmaker outside of a clockwork universe, both desacralized nature, nature then became an it to be used and exploited by us rather than a thou to be honored and respected in its own right. But it also trivialized God because that we began to think of God not as imminent and omnipresent, a, a reality that you can't not experience, but God became an idea that you could either believe in that external being or not believe <coughs> right. in that external being. Um, and so what I've, one of the ways of trying to provoke um, religious audiences especially is that I, I say in one of the last slides in my evening program, 
is uh, a slide that says obsolete and impotent notions of God and God's word are killing us, shrinking the church, destroying our world, and condemning our children and grandchildren to literal hell on earth. Well, I'm Ouch. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's uh, just when religious and moral guidance and righteous reverence for life is most needed, yes. it's the most absent. Right, right, right. Because of what I'm calling the triple idolatry. It's right. idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs. And by idolatry, I don't mean bowing down statues. I mean making something your ultimate commitment or ultimate concern that doesn't deserve to be, right, or in a way right, that betrays right. or defiles the future. Right. So idolatry of the written word is when you think reality's best guidance is in frozen, it, it, Billy Idolatry is another way to talk about it, yeah. But it's thinking that any book, any ancient text contains the best map of what's real and what's important mm -hmm. or how things are and which things matter. Idolatry of the otherworldly is where you think where ultimate value, ultimate holiness, ultimate, you know, the, ulti the ultimate reality exists outside time and nature. And idolatry of beliefs is when you think any one belief system is the only one right way <coughs> in relation to reality. So I'm sort of attacking those who I'm calling triple idolatries. Yeah, I've often thought that the, that the most uh, spiritually responsible or religiously responsible people are uh, agnostics, because um, if if a person knows what God is like, and if a person knows what God wants, that's a dangerous person. Well, only if you have a fictional understanding if you of God. Know, yeah. If you know what God is like. I'm talking about the traditional God, right? If you know what God is like and what God wants, you can justify any. Sure. And that has happened. And that's really scary. So I think um, yeah, humility in religious traditions is something that's sorely lacking. And uh, it's up to you guys to restore it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're up to the test. <laughs> bring them humility. Bring them down. Go on and bring them down. <laughs> well, what I'm trying to do is, is frame things in a way that's evidence-based, that, that it's beyond theism, atheism, agnosticism, that, you know, if right relationship to reality is what matters and has always mattered, mm -hmm. um, and if God can't possibly be less than a personification of reality, then the question of what is... God like what is reality like? Well, that's collectively discerned, and there's no one of us that has a, a, a single sort of pipeline of that. And what is God saying to us today? It's like, well, that's the that's the whole global community of evidence. What is reality saying to us? Um, well, it used to be it used to be history. I mean, some of the neo orthodox people would say, okay, the way to discern God's will or the way to discern ultimate reality is to look at patterns of history. History. Uh, God leads us through history, and so the patterns in history is a, a kind of revelation of God. And I think uh, the the story of cosmogenesis, cosmic evolution, has taken us away from that view, or rather expanded the notion of history. Now it's big right, history. Exactly. And so uh, historical um, evidence is physics and biology and chemistry and, and all the rest. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I love most about David Christian's big history course that he did for the teaching company. Connie and I first listened to the whole thing, 48 half-hour lectures. But we listened to the whole thing, and then we were so impressed with it, we bought the DVDs and we watched the whole thing. And both of us felt it was the single best educational experience we've ever had in our lives. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about it is that many times, like almost every other show, he kept coming back to, okay, here's what I just shared is what we know. How do we know that? Yeah. What's the evidence? Yeah. So he kept coming back again and again to what's the evidence? How have we come to know this? And he doesn't use God talk. He doesn't use religious language. Right. But for me, that very much is revealing what reality has, been, right. what reality is like, yeah. and what reality has been saying to us through evidence. Right. Well, the main part of this imperative that we're in now, in terms of religious naturalism, I'm not so convinced that we have to naturalize religion, but I am convinced we have to sacralize nature, as you show in your chapter. That's the immediate thing, that's where we're out of integrity, and that's where the old traditions that were regionally and tribally based can't offer us anything for the global ecological crises we have. And so that's where I really love, Michael's got this six-point plan, and in terms of what he says his credo is, and the one I really go with is, ecology is my theology. 
And so what I mean with that is right now, I mean, I don't know what happens next century, but right now, I don't have humility. I believe I know, and I know that we need to make an ecological understanding our root for deciding how our behavior will be. Uh, you know, two centuries from now, maybe we can go back into theological arguments about agnosticism or personifying God or whatever. Mm -hmm. But right now, ecology is my theology. We've got to get our act together, and how do we do it? We have to sacralize, sanctify nature. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, and the banners, the lessons. It's really important, though, to naturalize religion, to, to make it clear to people that religious traditions are have a history, yes. uh, that they are part of nature. We come to our religious behavior somehow naturally. Uh, and, and that gives us a, a little bit of distance from the tradition. Oh, and that it, it reduces the, the, the authoritative power that it has over us and also gives us license to, to own the tradition and to change it. Exactly. And change it in ways that will result in sanctifying nature. So I yeah. think that's really no, important. I'm 100% in agreement. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that I, 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 I hold most closely as a vision of possibility, a vision of what I'm committed to doing, is doing everything I can to ensure that at least in the spheres, my vision, let me say it as a vision, my vision is that 50 years from now, whatever things are like, whether we're in an overshoot and die back or whatever, but 50 years from now, the vast majority of religious people of all different kinds, you know, we're still going to have Buddhists, we're still going to have Hindus, we're still going to have Christians, we're going to still have Jews and Muslims and everything else. But I think, I hope, that the majority of all those folks will fully embrace an ecological evolutionary understanding of reality, including an evolutionary understanding of their own tradition. So that's that piece of naturalizing that, right. that I find. I sometimes say it this way, that you can't understand your religion, and you can't understand any religion, unless you step back and understand the evolutionary right. significance of religion in general. Right, exactly. And that's a key, the evolutionary significance yeah, of right, religion. Right. Because then there's an opening. Oh, it's not just one of these atheists telling me how, you know, why religion evolved and right. how we can just chuck it right. out. I say, no, the evolutionary significance, yeah. really. Yeah. Which, even though we are religious naturalists, by golly, all three of us agree with. Take it away, yeah. and we go back to family bands. Take right. it away, and we go back exactly. to campsite existence. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as we were talking before, before we were on camera at lunchtime, um, I was mentioning that the, the three most significant books that I know of in terms of the evolutionary significance of religion are your book, Religion is Not About God, Era Noriezen's uh, new book called Big Gods, How Religion uh, Transformed Conflict and Cooperation, and chapters 9 through 12 of Jonathan Haidt's book, uh, New York Times bestselling book, The Righteous Mind. Because I, I, it, unless people get the evolutionary significance, the absolute essential adaptive value of religion, then you're either going to be in your religion thinking that it's just the truth, so you're not even, you're just sort of ignoring all the other traditions, or you're going to be sort of in this anti-religious perspective that religions ought to just go away. Wouldn't it be nice if religions, you know, if religions just stop being? Um, but when you get the evolutionary significance of religion, and I think you, Aaron Noriez, and, and John Haidt do that better than anybody that I know of. And David again, Sloan Wilson actually right. does it. And again, as well. The evolutionary significance of religion does not mean only the evolutionary significance of supernatural well, no, religion. Well, no, because for me, the evolutionary significance exactly. of religion recognizes that the concept, you know, I say it this way, that in the entire history of the universe, 13.8 billion years of history, the only place that we have any evidence that the supernatural realm has ever existed is in the last 500 years of human speech and human imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prior to understanding things in a natural, scientific way, there was no need to posit a supernatural, a realm above right. or outside right. nature. Right. There, was, there was daytime experience and nighttime experience. And yeah, we do m magical things that are nighttime dreams, but when you fly in your dreams, you're not having a supernatural experience. You're no. having experience no. common to the right. dream state. Right. So this, even the notion of the supernatural is one that I think um, has had a real downside, a real shadow side too, because it then then people start valuing an imaginary supernatural realm right, right. over just the material. Uh, the, the, the need for the supernatural is created when, when uh, the natural is, is no longer 
sacred, sacred or exactly. No longer holy or uh, valuable. Sanctified. Exactly. Or, yeah. mm -hmm. Exactly. I think enchanted. A, enchanted. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I, I think another thing that this evolutionary understanding of the significance of religion and the phases it's gone through is it really helps people who are way modern and scientific like me have a new value for indigenous pre-written cultures that have passed their religions mm -hmm. you know up through to the modern times and that's that all of us come from indigenous heritages somewhere along the way on some continent and prior to writing we can trust that because our ancestors survived obviously they were part of cultures in which their shamans, leadership, elders, whatever, would take the best of the stories from the past, and then as condition changed, they would modify those stories to have the best functionality mm -hmm. for that moment. Yeah. So in orality, the stories can evolve. Right. And what happened with the classic religions, with scriptures, all yeah. scriptures, yeah. they got frozen in time by what Michael calls the idolatry of the natural world, or the, and written a, word. Of the, of the written word, mm -hmm. idolatry of the written word, and of course that would happen that way. But suddenly it means that, you know, it's like, oh, I got it, I got it. The problem is that religions stopped evolving. Mm -hmm. If they had kept evolving, we wouldn't be having this right. discussion. Because then the stories can't change about what's real and what's important. Yeah. The only thing that can change is the interpretations of the stories once yeah. you declare them the unchanging Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to naturalize. Exactly. Religion. Absolutely. And then, and then we can even admit that religious naturalism is just one more iteration Amen. in the development of human yep. thought about themselves and the world they live in. Amen.